Good morning, morning everybody. Yeah, We're on. Welcome to Kate's <laughs> or Die. And uh, if you were expecting us to stroll out on the skateboard, I'm sorry. We couldn't pull that off over the airplane. Um, my name is Ryan. This is my friend Marco. Hey. We have uh, deployed clouds and cubes and all sorts of fun things on different architectures over the last few years. And uh, we're here to basically talk about uh, Kubernetes and the various combinations of Kubernetes and OpenStack and reasons why you would combine the two. Um, and perhaps uh, whether you should combine the two in some cases. Uh, we hope to have some good conversation at the end of this. I think our presentation will be uh, maybe 20, 25 minutes, and then uh, we invite conversation at the mics. And of course, uh, if you will deploy Kubernetes, when, where, why, and how would you do this? Yeah. Right? So I have an OpenStack, multiple OpenStacks. Uh, already deployed. I have all of my applications deployed in a combination of VMs and containers today. Um, my control plane on all of my clouds is already containerized and highly available. So, Marco, why do I need Kubernetes? <laughs> yeah, it's such an interesting question. Um, it's been fun this whole week kind of watching the conversations that have been spurred about, about OpenStack, containers, the intersection of the two, Kubernetes, Docker Swarm. So I want to talk about why you might need Kubernetes and really why the need for Kubernetes is such a prevalent, prevalent conversation topic these days. And so to do that, we have to just take a step back and see what computing has been doing for the last couple of years. So this will be a real short history trip. So we're all familiar with this, I imagine. It's a, it's a server. It's a laptop. It's your computer. It's a Linux machine running Linux. It's got processors. It's got processes. These beautiful little lines. It's got a, some kind of disk, SSD, could be spinning rotary. It's got a bunch of networks plugged into the bottom of it. It's a server. Uh, it's not very exciting. We've had these for years now. I mean, many, many years. If you think of the real big innovation with servers and server spaces was virtual machines. And that was the whole idea of, well, my app doesn't really need to run that much. Uh, need to use the entire box for its app, I can actually get a lot of multi-tenancy by just saying, hey, I'm going to take a chunk of this machine. I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing I've done on my root server. I'm just going to run a bunch of processes. I'm going to run an operating system. It's going to have a disk. It's going to have a network. And it's just going to physically, I'm just going to basically carve out and virtualize the, the I.O. for this machine on the, on the host hardware. And that was exciting because, well, now we have a we have something we're very familiar with. It's servers. You're accessing them. You're SSHing to them. You have developers getting to them. You're putting applications on them. And it's really no different than when you were managing bare metal. You've just got a whole bunch more of them now. And it was very exciting. And so from there, we've kind of evolved a little further. And this is where things like process containers come into play. Uh, the idea about a process container is a bit different than what you'd see in a virtual machine or on a server. So if you're not familiar with a process container, this is things like Docker. These are things like Rocket. This is things like Run C. These are things that people have been clamoring about. This is usually what people mean, mention when they talk about containers. And the idea behind this is instead of taking the entire machine and running all of those processes and running all of those, uh, all of those items and your application and having a disk that you write to and manage and having all these network spaces, what if we took that a step further? What if instead of taking that and virtualizing all the I.O., what if we just confined it so that you just ran your process and you provided just enough OS to run that single process in a constrained, confined manner? And by doing so, you actually get a lot of density, a lot more density than you would out of VMs. You can run hundreds of thousands of Docker containers where previously you were physically allocating chunks of your hardware to. They all kind of share the same processor space. They share the same memory space. And they're generally running less processes in general. You're not running a NIT. You're not running SSH. You don't have cron jobs executing. Um, but this also comes with some drawbacks, and there's some different ways to manage these. You don't have a full disk anymore. Uh, generally speaking, you don't write to that same OS disk. Obviously, you can in some cases, but generally speaking, they're more immutable, and you're just running that process, and you're managing things coming in and pushing output somewhere else. And so what's interesting about this is because with virtual machines, we have this idea of traditional operations, things we've been doing for the whole time since we've had servers. You can run the Ansible against it. You can run configuration management against it. You can do virtually anything you can do against a server and a virtual machine. When we start talking about process containers, it actually takes on a whole new breed of operations. You can't SSH to it. You can't just run a playbook against it. You can't just go and manage it like you've been doing for traditional machines. 
And this is why we're seeing a bit of a shift in how we do management and why containers are this really big hot topic because it's unfamiliar, it's new, and it requires a whole new breed of tooling to figure out how to manage these at scale, much in the way we've come to accomplish managing virtual machines at scale. And so because of that, we lead into needing what we call container coordinator. So container coordinators are effectively that platform for how do I operate and manage containers. And so that is why we have this stride for Kubernetes and things like Kubernetes, Kubernetes, um, Docker Swarm, and the other projects, DCOS and Mesosphere, that are popping up. And they're all claiming to be this container, this nebulous container thing. And what it really means is how do I operate and manage containers at scale in a sane way that I've come to expect when managing things like VMs? So what does Kubernetes look like when we pull together the architecture and the services that it takes to build? Yeah, so I guess that was more of the why. I guess you're asking what, what does a Kubernetes actually look like then? Yeah, how do what, I manage what, it? What does it look like? Well, Kubernetes is, surprisingly and shockingly, just software. It's nothing special. It's not a magic hat. It's not a cape that you can wrap around your neck and fly off into the free world proclaiming DevOps is done and, I, and, and <laughs> celebrating that. Um, Kubernetes is software, and it's actually, from an architecture perspective, since Kubernetes is a container coordinator, what you're really getting is actually the abstraction of those machine resources, those VM primitives, those things where Kubernetes is running, you're getting an abstraction for those for your Docker containers. And what it really amounts to is effectively giving you the abstraction of compute, networking, and storage for Docker-style containers. Now, I'm sure this sounds strikingly familiar to a couple other projects you might be familiar with. But essentially, at the end of the day, as a Kubernetes as a platform, it's just providing that mechanism to say, I'm going to run containers. I'm going to run them here. They're going to be on this network. They're going to have potentially this storage pools attached. And they're going to be running on these classes of machines or these types of processors with these compute resources. And so because Docker containers are, well, generally speaking, such a small surface area, it's a single process running on a virtually immutable disk with some semblance of networking, we actually have a platform that grows a lot of capabilities that were tougher in previous generations of computing. Um, doing things like rollout and rollbacks of applications, while absolutely that's something you could do today on traditional VMs, but it took quite a lot of time to produce the tooling to get to that place. Same thing with scaling up and scaling back. All these primitives, while they are present today, they took quite a lot of engineering work to go from I have a VM to I have a VM that I can scale dynamically to a VM that I can upgrade dynamically and be confident in that upgrade or to a VM I can roll back. And in addition to that, you get things like load balancing, uh, self-healing, service discovery, things we'll talk about in a little bit. But basically, because the actual idea of what a container is, uh, a process container like Docker-style containers, because it's so small and so strongly defined as a surface area, it's actually easy for platforms to start building these primitives in, where previously it was actually quite a difficult feat. And so that's what's gotten a lot of buzz around things like Kubernetes and these platforms, is because they have these features that took arguably quite a long time to figure out how to solve, and there are still some areas where they can improve with operating traditional style VMs. So I want to talk just real briefly about what a Kubernetes architecture looks like. You know, what does it actually mean to run Kubernetes? Uh, does anyone here actually run Kubernetes or running Kubernetes today? Hey, yes, the brave, the brave few hands raised. Um, how many people are actually interested in running Kubernetes like this, this next six months? Like, I'm definitely going to get into this Kubernetes thing. Yeah. Everyone's talking about it. I'm sure developers are clamoring for it. They're sitting there throwing Docker containers at your ops guys, and your ops guys are like, stop doing that, please. Um, so Kubernetes is a platform because, again, we're dealing with a very small surface area. It's actually quite small from an architecture perspective. It effectively breaks down to uh, a few components. You have the Kubernetes core software itself. Uh, you have etcd, which is its data backing store. And then you have some form of, of, of SSL TLS certificates. And I mention this because I think in this day and age, it's generally imperative that anyone building clusters, anyone building production infrastructure should be encrypting that communication from the control plane to the workers to the clients themselves. And Kubernetes makes it pretty easy to start consuming those types of things, building a secure cluster um, with TLS encryption and such. So, those components are basically arranged in this kind of fashion. So you have a TLS certificate authority. Easy RSA is what Upstream recommends. It's pretty easy to set up. It just spits out certs. Um, and you can just have your Kubernetes and your etcd clusters run with those. 
Um, etcd itself is a distributed data store. It's from CoreOS. It does things like quorum and data protection, uh, does the proper peering and things, and it's basically a wrapped back key value store at, at the lowest level. Um, so it's very robust and reliable, and is what, etcd, uh, what Kubernetes uses to do its coordination of data. Then you have a master control plane service, and this is actually pretty small in and of itself as well. It's just an API server, which is what you, your clients, your, your users talk to. Uh, there's a scheduler, which does that things like, uh, well, I need to make sure I have these number of, of workloads running. I need to make sure that if one of these goes down, I bring another one up. It implements a lot of that logic around auto-healing and auto-scaling. Then you have a controller manager, which helps to coordinate all of the different pieces that are moving inside of a deployment. And then finally, you have your workers. Um, and this is where you're actually running your workloads. And there you're running a thing called kubelets. You're usually running a kube proxy. Your container runtime, Docker, Rocket, uh, OCID, there's a whole bunch that are supported now. And then some sort of networking SDN, some CNI, container networking interface compatible component, like Flannel, like Calico, Weave, and there's a bunch of others as well. And at the end of the day, that's typically what an architecture for a Kubernetes deployment looks like. Now, that'll vary, and we'll talk about how that varies a little bit and maybe how that can be utilized to solve and tackle other problems. But at the end of the day, this is typically what you'll find walking to anyone running a Kubernetes cluster today. And because a lot of this stuff is Dockerized, because a lot of this stuff is containerized, it actually lends itself to running in a very converged fashion. Um, so a lot of times you'll see with just maybe, really with just one machine, you can run a single Kubernetes cluster. But really with three machines, you can actually run an HA cluster where you're scheduling workloads. You're also running the API control plane services and the data store services. Um, so again, this is just an example of an architecture. These vary quite a bit depending on where you are, but that's effectively what you can see in most places that are running small clusters to get the most amount of density out of the hardware they're piloting on. Thanks. So, yeah, so I mean, I'm a Kubernetes guy. I don't know if you guys have picked up on that. Um, <laughs> it's kind of that thing. I've, I'm really interested in cloud native architectures and stuff. Um, I'm just kind of a cloud consumer, actually. I just, uh, I pay someone a bunch of money to run VMs somewhere that I'll never have to go look at um, in a public cloud. But what I really want to know, I think this might be a silly question for this audience, but I want to know what, Kubernetes, what, what OpenStack is and well, uh, why people keep talking about it here. So first of all, that was a ton of good information. Thanks. I feel like <laughs> yeah, I know Kubernetes now. Um, so what is OpenStack? That is a loaded question. So if we think like 10 years ago, before OpenStack, we're Linuxing and virtualizing and doing all of our things with VMs and how are we tracking compute network and storage? Um, how did we manage that? What tools were there in the in the pure open source world? Um, I think that uh, there was a void clearly and that's where OpenStack fills. Um, so, you know, there have been folks uh, uh, put it akin to basically a fancy spreadsheet that is tracking that compute storage and network if you're talking pure infrastructure as a service. Um, so you have OpenStack uh, as basically a collection of API services as a service-oriented architecture. And um, the, the actual layout can, can vary quite a lot. Uh, there again, this looks a whole lot like um, your converged architecture uh, that you had a moment ago. Um, this is a similar layout to some of the clouds that I've got running um, where we spread the control plane across compute and storage and uh, it's available uh, as, a, as a highly available cloud. Um, so I don't think that uh, diving into what is OpenStack at the OpenStack Summit is probably a good use of time. So let's move right along to what it means to combine the two. Yeah, so where does, uh, if I have Kubernetes, do I really need OpenStack? And if you have OpenStack, do you really need Kubernetes? Maybe. All right, all right, all right, we should probably Maybe. find out. So let's look at some of the combinations that we've seen out there, right? So let's say you have an existing OpenStack. You have a uh, production cluster, perhaps you have a dev cloud, maybe you have both, staging, production, all of the various things. Uh, you can certainly have your tenants stand up uh, Kubernetes and have individual clusters that they can consume. Again, whether those are production workloads or for development. So I, that's like a lot what I do today then. If I yeah, go to yeah. Amazon and deploy Kubernetes cluster, I basically just do it on top of OpenStack if I had a private cloud. Yeah, right, right. So we, we do some of the same uh, with, with our dev cloud. Uh, so another scenario is that um, you've got an existing OpenStack, you have some spare bare metal, and you stand up your cluster of Kubernetes alongside OpenStack. Uh, I think these each have different use cases. So that's like uh, this guy I work with who does data science stuff and just loves GPUs. Right. And runs a ton of machine learning with stuff. So he always is clamoring for more metal. So if he were to dockerize his stuff, running that on Kubernetes on bare metal makes 
probably more sense for him? It could make a ton of sense, yeah. Yeah, All right. yeah, yeah. access to, uh, uh, to virtualized hardware. Uh, so something that's gaining traction, um, you know, if you rewind six months and then rewind six months from that, there were ideas about uh, dockerizing the OpenStack control plane and other services and uh, distributing that and managing that with Kubernetes, right? So there are yeah, projects right. out there doing this. Interesting. And so this is an interesting thing. Uh, so basically containerizing the control plane in a Docker-like container. So these are not mutually exclusive. If you have these varying approaches in your organization, you may end up with something that looks like this, right? You've got metal, you've got Kubernetes, Kubernetes sitting on that metal. That Kubernetes cluster may be delivering multiple applications for your enterprise. Uh, one of those applications might just be the OpenStack control plane or other OpenStack services. Uh, and then again, you could have your tenants wanting their own Kubernetes cluster. I actually think I saw someone do that this week. I think we've seen this a couple of times, right? Yeah, yeah so there, there are all kinds of different analogies. Um, I think that people, whether they're intending to or not, were, are going to end up with things that look a lot like this. And uh, I think that uh, they're, you know, each of the projects that deliver these things are maturing. And, uh, it's interesting. Yeah, it is an interesting thing. So let's think about or talk about some of the uh, projects that are out there uh, to help you achieve these things, um, whether it's for just exploring, uh, or looking at doing something in production. So naturally there are uh, heat templates. Um, I'm not sure if they're community driven or by the heat project, but they're centered around de deploying Kubernetes on top of OpenStack. Uh, the Magnum project has Kubernetes uh, capabilities and a couple of other things out there. The Kubernetes charms, which are upstream in the Kubernetes project, uh, can deploy and manage the lifecycle of Kubernetes on top of OpenStack. Uh, Kubeatom naturally, um, pretty much works on anything. That's kind of the, the, the nitty gritty way to go and do, do some things. Yeah, so, it's, uh, so that's from a Kubernetes side, Kubeatom's an interesting project because it's yeah. tackling kind of uh, how do you self bootstrap a cluster. They're getting very close to being ready for stable testing, which is exciting. That's cool. Uh, so something that's in incubation, incubation is the Cargo project, and uh, there again, it has uh, relevance to the OpenStack project. So some of these have varying degrees of maturity. Um, I think it'll be interesting to watch the ecosystem grow and, uh, and some of these things gain traction. Sure, but all of these on the right-hand side, because obviously Heat and Magnum, those are OpenStack projects, right. but Charms, Kubatom, and Cargo, all of those speak to the OpenStack API natively, as I understand. So yep. if you're looking to turn up a Kubernetes cluster, those are kind of upstream Kubernetes ways of tackling that problem. Yeah, right, so they are specific. Upstream to Kubernetes, I guess yeah, you should yeah. say. Yeah, so they'll be specific to OpenStack, right? So if you, if you have uh, uh, automation built around Magnum or Heat, it pr pretty much predicts that you will be installing this on, on OpenStack. Uh, so let's take this and flip it around. There are uh, a couple of projects uh, that are geared toward putting your OpenStack control plane and perhaps other services into Docker-style containers on Kubernetes. Um, it seems there are two kind of uh, in the OpenStack world that are filling this, this role, and they might be in some ways in competition with one another. Um, those of you who are not familiar with Helm is uh, not a specific OpenStack project, it basically allows you to use charts to deploy applications in your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, there's a project called OpenStack Helm that leverages that, and I believe Kala Images under the hood. Yeah, so Kala seems like it's a project, Kala itself at OpenStack is a project to build Docker containers for all of the services that you can deploy with an OpenStack. And then Kala Kubernetes is taking those images and just using the Kubernetes API directly, where right. Helm is more like a package manager for Kubernetes, and it's a different approach to solving that same problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So Kala actually is not specific to Kubernetes. Uh, there are a couple of different flavors of the Kala project. Um, the Kala Kubernetes is, is just one of them. Uh, so these will be interesting to watch um, and, and see how these things mature and, and um, perhaps uh, progress over time. And finally, the scenario that uh, might be quite common is to take Kubernetes directly onto the metal. And I know we touched on that a minute ago, um, but the tooling to do this um, arguably is, is uh, widespread and not very clear. There are a number of things in the uh, upstream Kubernetes docs about how to take and, and lay down a Kubernetes cluster, uh, whether that be in any number of um, config management tools. Um, essentially, the ones that, uh, you know, that, that we use and that, that I've used and uh, like to use are the Kubernetes charms. There again, it's, these are in the upstream uh, Kubernetes project. Um, these allow you to um, deploy and manage the lifecycle of your Kubernetes cluster, including upgrades. Yep. Same with uh, Kubatom again, which kind of yep. just works on any VM. 
uh, where there's a whole process for bootstrapping a cluster, having cluster expand and grow, and then um, as they move towards finishing this dev cycle, which should be done pretty soon, they'll have a, a nice upgrade story as well alongside that. Yeah, yeah. So um, who here has stood up a Kubernetes cluster the hard way? <laughs> should probably. <laughs> I don't, well, I don't know, so I'm talking about the... Uh, Who here has uh, gone and made a bunch of VMs and did a bunch of WGETs and done a bunch of hand configuration of stuff? There we go. That's a brave, you're brave. How yeah, yeah. would you, how would you, so it was, I can see where Ryan's going here. It's super important because I bet you learned a lot about how Kubernetes is actually built under the covers. So you went, you went even harder. You said, you know what, pre-built binaries is... <laughs> That's too easy. I have to go compile it by hand. Awesome. <laughs> For sure. And that, that's kind of my point, is that um, if I ask the same question of the stackers in the room, who has gone out and done the same on a pile of machines, not in DevStack, and stood up a functional OpenStack by hand, um, it's worth doing once. You probably don't want to do it twice, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it is good. I, I think there's a there's a great there's a great uh, great blog series called Kubernetes the Hard Way. If you haven't read it, yeah. and while you may not want to actually go down the adventure of hand setting these things up, because it is going to take you a few days to get through and get a successful cluster running, uh, it's a really good read on understanding how all the components interact with each other, how they're built, how they're designed, what the architecture looks like, and some of the pitfalls that come commonly with deploying clusters. But generally speaking, you'll find, just like with OpenStax, you'll want to find a way to actually start automating that process. Yeah, for sure. Just one comment. Uh, well, the reason I went in that way is because the Cube AGM, it doesn't allow you to have a mul multiple ETCD running. Yeah. So you're stuck with a single point of failure or ETCD. You want to have a redundancy, and you cannot use that. You have to use manual way. Sure. So the point is, is that today, Kubeatom is not yet a stable, production-ready tool. It's one that they're building towards. It's a project that's also being incubated in the upstream. But it does things like it's not HA out of the box, or you can't even do HA, really. Uh, where other projects like Cargo against OpenStack or Charms against OpenStack or Metal, uh, those take into consideration high availability of database services and control plane features and such. Um, but Kubeatom is very interesting because it is a... It is kind of, uh, if you want to do it yourself but don't want to go down the road of compiling everything and then hand configuring everything, Kubernetes gives you a really nice feel of you're building the cluster, you're making choices, you're doing everything by hand effectively, but it does take care of a lot of the more tedious functions of bootstrapping SSL certificates for yourself and producing other things that make it so you can get a secure cluster running when they're ready and out of uh, development um, in an HA fashion. Awesome. So when you, when you think about you know, abstracting the tooling um, and you want to have a Kubernetes running on any given substrate, whether it's a public cloud or OpenStack or directly on metal or on your laptop, the tooling varies quite a lot. And there, there are some pros and cons to each, right? Um, but in terms of uh, being able to do this across the board, um, these are basically the, the, the two that, that, that kind of that, spread the gap. Yeah, yeah. That, spread, that definitely spread the gap. Um, so Kubernetes and OpenStack together, um, it's an interesting combination for sure. And there are, a, as you've seen, a couple of approaches, more than a couple. Um, and I think varying reasons for doing one over the other or all of them together. So it seems like in our time discussing this, what I've come to kind of start accepting is I was always very happy to say, you know what, the future is containers. Um, but I think there's actually a bit of a different story here. I think what I've learned after trying to push everything into a container um, and what I've tried to do running everything on Kubernetes or Swarm is really it's going to come down to it's not Kubernetes versus OpenStack, but it's really about your architecture. And what it boils down to is whether you're running something that's stateless or whether you're running something that's stateful. And I know this is a loaded term. Um, I know, Ryan, you helped participate in the interop. You wanna, yeah. Did you all see the interop stuff? That was cool. It, do yeah, uh, you want to explain real quickly what sure, that sure, was? Sure, sure, sure. So the interop challenge is um, uh, an effort where uh, we take multiple uh, clouds, public, private clouds of varying distribution and version, and demonstrate that OpenStack, its APIs, its product, is able to function in the same way, regardless of those varying vendors and distributions and versions. 
so the workload this time around for the Interop Challenge was a uh, Kubernetes cluster on top of OpenStack with CockroachDB pod uh, deployed in that. And then beyond that, these CockroachDB uh, databases were uh, clustered across these various clouds. So this is, this is kind of a cool effort, but my understanding of databases is that they're very much a stateful thing. So how does that work into this? Yeah, so I liked it um, very early on in the interrupt challenge. Everyone, oh, one of the people stood up and was like, they explained that you're gonna hear people arguing about stateful and stateless applications this whole week. Um, but CockroachDB is arguably stateful and it runs in Kubernetes fine and does a good job. And I think really this slide is a little misleading as well. Stateful itself is a huge, it's a pretty nebulous term. What does it actually mean to be something stateful? I think stateless is pretty loaded. clear. But stateful is a, really, is a really awkward term. And what I've kind of found is that there is definitely a generation divide between software being built. And we look at CockroachDB, if you're not familiar with it, it's pretty cool. Um, but what it does is basically gives you a SQL interface against a distributed data store. And CockroachDB was designed to be resilient out of the box. It was designed to do clustering, peering, and stuff. And what it's really designed for is really designed for a cloud-native architecture, an architecture where if one machine goes down, it's expected to happen. And so while you have a consistent state present across all those nodes, no one state is, no one machine or VM or Docker container has state that will, if, go, if it goes missing, will break the cluster. And so in that respect, it's a distributed stateful application, and because of that, it actually survives quite well and thrives, as we saw in Interop, um, inside, of a, inside of a Dockerized container Kubernetes deployment. Whereas a lot of apps that were written, I'm guilty of this as well, um, early, earlier generations of applications are really written to be more tightly coupled than that. So if you have an application that depends on being on the same disk and having data persisted on that disk so that other parts of the application can read that, that's a really super stateful application, and if you can't just take those components and run them over the network to each other, or run the data and store it externally, you're actually gonna take a, quite a lot of engineering effort to actually detangle that. And so what results is a lot of engineering effort to make that application super cloud architecture friendly, cloud native architecture, whereas a lot of developers today are building applications with that in mind. CockroachDB is a good example of that. And a lot of our distributed data stores, etcd itself, again, another data store that persists data, but it's designed in a way that if you're running it in resilience, more than a couple of nodes running, if one goes away, you can bring a new one up, it'll rejoin the cluster, re-get its data, and it won't lose connectivity to that cluster. It's designed in a way to be resilient in a cloud architecture because, well, frankly, clouds are ephemeral. And Docker containers, even more so. Um, and so I think that's where we start to see the divide, is it's not just all stateful applications as a, as a general blanket statement that you can't or shouldn't run them in, inside Kubernetes, but it's about taking the tasteful discretion to see which application can I run in Kubernetes, which application should I be running in Kubernetes, and a lot of times we'll find that there's a good mix of things where developers want to go really quickly, they have an application that suits that architecture, but you've also got database operators and you've got general sysadmins that are gonna to wanna to make sure that they handcraft VMs and that they manage those VMs and that they do things to persist that data at, a, at an infrastructure level, whether it's snapshotting that data, whether it's making sure it's backed up and robust, or, or running multiple services like cron jobs and other things on that. And I think that's fine to sit in a VM. I think that's where you'll find the intersection of yeah, yeah, I Kubernetes think and certainly for some time, infrastructure management. Yeah, for, for some time we'll have a combination, no doubt. Um, the sessions that I've attended this week have been some really good ones that, that dive perhaps a little deeper even than we are into some of these areas. And what, what I'm seeing overwhelmingly is that the, the control plane is, is easy, right? These are stateless things. These are services you can cluster. Um, storage becomes an issue. Ceph, what do we do with Ceph? If I'm an old, if I'm an old school Cephy and I just want my Ceph to do Ceph stuff, I mean, we have things that are happening to help improve that story but it doesn't seem like we're quite there yet. Persistent volume claims perhaps is uh, a trend that, that will help solve these kind of things. Um, so how, does, how do you think that fits into here? And should I keep my Ceph um, on VMs or on metal? Uh, or should, should we be pushing that threshold to try to lift and shift as it were that some folks Yeah, uh, so I think Ceph's, Ceph's a super interesting one. I don't have a really good answer for people. I know it's, hard to run in Kubernetes, whereas installing Ceph on a VM and configuring it to talk to your uh, Ceph mons is actually quite simple. But Ceph mons an interesting story because you could potentially run that containerized, 
the monitor for Ceph, but OSDs probably would live on disk. And in the same vein, I could see things like Horizon, super staple application. That makes total sense to run in a container. But MySQL seems like it might be slightly more problematic or a more traditional SQL Server application. Yeah, right. I think we'll see vendors, especially those that are running database services, they'll all work to containerize their applications. In fact, I want to point out something real funny. Um, because I've, I've been praising the CockroachDB guys this whole time. Um, so I went to go download their software. Oh, did I spell cockroach? I did. <laughs> I went to go download their software, and I said, okay, I'm going to go grab their Docker container. Live uh, Googling is dangerous. Holy crap. <laughs> so I went to their documentation, and I said, okay, I'm going to go grab, I'm going to go install it. Oh, good gosh, I got to go figure out the navigation here one second. So I said, oh, yeah. great, I'll just use Docker. And the first thing they say is, uh, you probably shouldn't do this in Docker. Um, you can, but it's actually quite hard. And it is, it's a hard problem to solve. So even something like CockroachDB, which as we see it excels in a platform that's Dockerized and in a Kubernetes fashion, even they are still having ways to figure out how do we do things right in containers that allow us to do persistence of data and stuff. So I'm sure the Docker container is great. It's not a slight. I actually haven't run it yet, so I can't really judge it for myself. But it's very interesting that you'll see that more vendors, CockroachDB, I'm sure MySQL, I'm sure MariaDB, I'm sure Postgres will all find ways to containerize their services for those that want to consume it in that fashion. But it will take effort for them to re-architect their software to be conducive to that fashion. And so in the same vein, if you're running software today that you've written, odds are you'll have to do a lot of work or a little bit of work to get it in a state that can just run easily on Kubernetes. Whereas developing your next application to run on Kubernetes makes much more sense. It is something that's a little more tenable than going back and re-architecturing, re-engineering everything. And because of that, I think in the next five, six years, we'll see a nice heterogeneous deployment of things managing VMs and things managing Docker containers. And then who knows by then? We'll hit serverless. We'll probably hit quantum containers by then as well. So the whole world will change, and it'll be an ever-evolving landscape. Right, right. So we do want to have time for comments, yeah. questions, and um, yeah, a few minutes. Cool. conversation, really. Um, so, the idea here is to, uh, you know, for folks to be able to share some information, experiences, things like that. I know it's not a fishbowl, but we can make it that. Yes, yeah, so if you have a question, feel free to just queue up in front of the microphones. Otherwise, I could continue talking about containers for the next eight minutes. No, no questions at all? So everybody understands why you need Kubernetes and where you're going to use it. I'm, I'm still figuring that out, by the way. Let's we'll take a question <laughs> I think first. everybody yeah. is, kind uh, of. Hi, guys. Thanks for the great presentation. <laughs> uh, Maybe architectural question. Uh, how would you model more complex application stacks where you have something what is really stateful, like database, which maybe should run in VM, yeah. and application and web servers which could potentially run in containers? Yeah. Uh, and how, do, how would you orchestrate the whole stack? Would you use heat and some configuration management plus Kubernetes? or? It's going to be, it's honestly going to be really dependent upon what your team's familiar with. I think all of those are great options. What you'll likely see is that you'll run and operate your stateful services in VMs, and you'll almost make that consumable as a service to your, to your Dockerized workloads, where you'll say, hey, my DB admin or some person's going to go, they're going to go create you this database, this username, this password, that's what you have, and then as your developers roll those things out, those containerized stateless applications, they'll simply just configure them to use that as a service. So to them, it's a black box. It's no different than database as a service effectively in the cloud. It's just that you're maintaining the VMs behind there as well. Um, it could also even be database as a service, potentially. Um, but we'll see that, that, I think we'll see that SaaS model evolve quite a bit more to where those kind of containers running in these platforms will just consume them as endpoints, and they won't really necessarily know or need to coordinate between them. It'll be a pre-set up step, potentially scripted, um, and then just configured as well, either using Helm, either directly through Kubernetes, or some other form of configuration management platform. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Yes. Can you talk a bit about where, the, with the intersection of these things, where things like a Atomic Host and CoreOS with immutable architecture fit in? Yeah, so those are two super interesting things. Um, I think what we, what we see is a general shift into people saying, if I'm going to be running containers, if I'm going to be managing these platforms, I want the lowest, I want to abstract the lowest level possible. 
And Kubernetes gives you that abstraction to where you're not even worried about machines anymore or placements. You just want to have containers running somewhere. So the idea of having a host be completely immutable and inaccessible, um, not writable at all, is super alluring. There are definitely some trade-offs to that. Um, so CoreOS specifically has a platform that is effectively a blob of OS with a bunch of things pre-baked into there. And then they auto-update themselves and reboot the machine to give you that latest platform. Um, there are advantages to that. It's secure uh, by nature. You can't write to those root volumes. Um, but then again, at, at the same time, if you find that um, you're looking to add additional capabilities to that blob, it's not, that's a lot harder to do. Um, what we really see is people doing things like secure confinements of the components they care about that have that intersection of potential security vulnerabilities. So that's things like confining the actual Kubernetes control plane so that the binaries running can only run the binaries and not touch anything else on disk. But the OS is still accessible, so you can SSH to it, you can install additional software, drivers, capabilities that you're looking to do. Um, it's still a lot to be figured out there, they're still a bit blurry, uh, but that's kind of the trend we see is those who are using these immutable OSs eventually come to the point where they say what's in the OS and what I actually need to run is something completely different, or there's an there's a, a overlap of things that I need to install there. But, but great question. Yes. Hi. Uh, at the risk of uh, asking you guys to uh, go into holy war territory, I'm ready. Uh, can you uh, compare, contrast, um, and maybe even provide some decision points on other container orchestrators, in yeah. particular Docker Swarm and Mesos? That is not a holy war, actually. So we've dodged a bullet there, thankfully. I thought you were going to ask me about Vim or Emacs or something. That would have been, that would have been <laughs> wholly unfortunate. Um, so. Each container platform is tackling a separate set of feature sets. And it's actually very interesting for consumers today because you have a lot of choice. Um, Docker Swarm, I view, is a platform at a high level. It's just basically run a VM, so, or sorry, run a container somewhere. Um, with Kubernetes, you get a lot more facilities to manage what that machine, what that VM, oh my goodness, what that container looks like, uh, how to manipulate and modify the scale for those things, how it plums into other things, so the service discovery aspect. It becomes much more like infrastructure platform as a service. Whereas when you tip into DCOS and Mesosphere, they also do a lot of things that overlap with Kubernetes, but they tackle them in different architectural ways. So they themselves can actually run more than just Docker containers. Uh, so the platform for scheduling and management is not just limited to process and Docker style containers. So it's really a breed of, you, know, you have a very simple management of a cluster of machines that are just spinning up Docker processes, and that's Docker Swarm. Uh, you've got Kubernetes, which does quite a bit more in the management and lifecycle of containers. And then you've got things like DCOS and Mesosphere, which give you the same kind of primitives you get from Kubernetes, but be able to run those against potentially different runtimes and different container types. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think we have a few more minutes left. Yeah, so we've got two minutes till time. Uh, encourage any questions or conversation, for sure. So, out of curiosity, of those, of those still left here, um, who here is, I know we raised this of hands earlier, but who here is going to be deploying Kubernetes in the next six months again? How many of you are going to be the primary consumers of that? Or are you doing it for your development teams or another team in the company that's asking for it? Sorry, sorry, we asked it in a binary fashion. <laughs> Put your hand up if you're doing it for someone else other than you or your team. Yeah, interesting. So, I mean, what are, you, what are your general feelings about it? Are you excited about technology? Is it something you're just, another thing you have to run as a workload? I'm curious of what, what, your, what your consensus is of Kubernetes as a platform is something that is being requested upon you. No one has any opinions? It's cool, I get it. It's still early in the morning, so I understand. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I'm, I'm actually in an architecture group in, in the company I'm in. Essentially, uh, make our DevOps group uh, and our applications more scalable. Hmm. Right. So the way we've done things historically, which is VMs for everything, and a lot of manual configuration, and a lot of manual install and setup, and many many snowflakes, um, isn't scalable. Yeah. Um, and so we have to do something about it. I'm here to get tools to experiment on doing things about it. And cool. I'm kind of handing these out to certain groups to be the, the, the pioneers and try it out and see what works and what doesn't work. Interesting. Awesome. So I we, hear that story a lot for sure. Yeah. 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 We're, we're at time. Uh, so thank you for coming. We, uh, we came um, not with all of the answers on, by intention. Uh, we wanted to spur some conversation and some thought. 
into these uh, architectures. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, here are, is our uh, Twitter handles and a couple of URLs that may be of interest. Absolutely. Please reach out. Thank you all. Thank you. Great questions. Yeah.